have a, a friend, Yon Bejanaro, who is coming all the way from uh, UC San Diego, luckily easy drive, good sunshine, et cetera, um, to come here and will speak to us on dynamics of equivariant Schrodinger maps near solitons. Thank you, Yon. Thank you. Thank you, Susan, for the kind invitation to speak uh, uh, for you. It's my pleasure. It's, I've been here about 10 years ago. Yeah, time flies. Thank you, yeah, time flies. Lightning. Um, so uh, today I'll speak about uh, what that was my original intention, dynamics of equivalent Schrodinger maps near solitons, but then I kind of realized that this, this, this uh, seminar goes by Colombia, so. Mm -hmm. I, it does. I, I, I say, okay, so maybe I should I should prepare this more as a Colombia, which just got to me like, you know, a couple of days ago when I was preparing the slides. So I'll still talk a little about this in the last few slides, but I'll try to give more of a colloquium style in which I'll introduce uh, the problems, uh, some of the questions around it, some of the phenomenology. And over the last few slides, I'll talk about the new result, which is uh, the one that's joined with, with my postdoc, uh, Mohandas Pillai and, and Daniel Tatal. So let's start easy. Uh, Let's review some of the most basic equations that uh, you know we all uh, know because if you do PD, either you end up you study them or you teach your students or so. So these are the heat or parabolic equation, uh, the wave or the hyperbolic equation, and the Schrodinger equation. And uh, you know you add some nonlinearities some vector variations of these, and pretty much everyone who does PDE is going to form one of these type of uh, uh, PDEs. And just a very quick observation, the above uh, equations were meant for functions defined uh, depending on time and, and spatial variables, uh, real or complex values, complex or first voices. You can always take the functions to be complex, for instance, for Schrodinger, you are forced put an i there, you, you are forced to work on these very functions. So a lot of interesting problems occur when the domain or the range of these maps, so the domain here or the range, uh, in, either of them can be manifolds. Uh, and in this talk, I will keep the domain flat, so I'm going to be in this setup, but allow the range not to be flat. And some very interesting models for these PDs occur from a very, very simple consideration. Try to emulate any of these PDs, the free ones, not nonlinear, not anything, just try to write them down in the case when the range is a manifold. How would they look like? I'm not going to run the, the argument for, uh, for all of them, but I'll start with the one that probably most, most people are, are uh, familiar with. Forget about the Riemannian manifold. How do you get the Laplace's equation? Well, you take the gradient u squared, right? The only reason you see this complicated is because I have a metric, but imagine that you have the flat metric. You take the gradient u squared, you integrate it, that's the energy. What are harmonic maps? Well, those are critical points for this energy. And you run your variational argument. And what you see there is minus Laplace U. And there is this, let's say, more nonlinear formulation. Gamma are the Christopher symbols. But let's say, if you are flat, the Christopher symbols are 0. You don't have any curvature. This would be 0. You get harmonic map harmonic functions, minus plus u equals zero. If you have some geometry, then you end up with a nonlinear elliptic problem. Now, in the particular case, when the target is the two-dimensional sphere, and more or less everything that I'm going to say in this talk will be for maps valued in, in uh, the two-dimensional sphere embedded in, in a tree, uh, the equation takes a fairly simple form. You can just read it. Minus Laplace u is u 
grad u square or u cross Laplace u equal zero. So these are the harmonic maps in the case of maps failing the manifold and associated to it, you have the heat flow for harmonic maps, which is pretty much you just stuck ut times equal to nonlinearity. And this would be, again, if you try to emulate the free heat equation for maps valued here, you end up with this PDE. And the reason you end up with a nonlinear PDE, although you want to emulate what the free equation is, is because you have curvature. So this is the, the, the case for the heat equation. Uh, oh, and by the way, just because, you know, you wanna, if, if you don't like the geometrical thing, in the particular case of S2, it's a very simple form, ut minus Laplace u, like this, or uh, I, I like this more because it, it, it's easier to, to pair it with, with the cousin, the, the Schrodinger cousin. I already said uh, this, that the takeaway I want you to have from this is that it's a natural equivalent of free linear heat equation for maps of regions restricted to a manifold and the fact that the nonlinearity is, is caused by curvature. Now I'm not gonna do this because it's uh, gonna be technical, but similarly, uh, you can derive the same equations or cousin equation, the free wave equation, Schrodinger equation for maps holes Ranges you see the domain manifold and you obtain wave maps or Schrodinger maps. Uh, just something, yes. Um, <clears throat> so anything can be can, can anything be said about the converse? Given a nonlinearity, can you say anything about the range or the curvature? How should I understand your question? Because so, to me, the nonlinearity is created by the curvature. Um, yes. Okay. But so in the case of S2, uh, equation takes the specific form. Right? Exactly. Yeah. Uh, so given a certain nonlinearity on a manifold, but we don't know a priori whether the manifold is something like S2 or not, is it possible to um, say anything about the curvature at least locally? You say, if I can read the manifold, if I have the nonlinear PD somehow. Yes. Uh, I mean, presumably, I can try to read them from the Christopher symbols. That's the most I can say based on what I understand from the Polish chain. Uh, the thing is, you can also have nonlinear interactions on the manifold. Here I'm simply taking somehow the linear version. I mean, we have something going on in the manifold. These are somehow the most basic models. So That's they're automatically the modulus of U is equal to one. Precisely. The it's, coming, it's, in, it's in the equation. It's in the equation. It's built. Yep, yep. That's, uh, and, and one simple uh, way to see, look at this equation. When you do U cross, So this is your vector. When you do a U cross with any object, you are automatically thrown into the tangent plane. So the evolution goes to the point. You, you are actually the evolution in the bundles. So uh, that's that. Okay. And and the, the, the one observation that I uh, so you see, when, when I want to emulate Schrodinger, I need to have on that manifold some, some sort of an I because of the complex structure. So uh, pretty much if you want to have a Riemannian manifold with the complex structures and compatibility between the metric M, D, and complex structure, you get k -like manifolds. But I'm not going to get there. I'm not going to generalize things. So that would be a different story. I'm just going to keep uh, things in S2 because then everything is explicit. And you can combine the heat flow 
for harmonic maps and Schrodinger maps and create actually this type of model uh, equation. And I'm going to talk about it. So it's U T is a cross Laplace U. So if you remember, if I delete this, this would be the heat flow. If I delete this and keep this, this will be the Schrodinger maps flow. So you have these two, two, two components, uh, and I'll talk about this model. I want to do natural questions why I study these equations. Just say put that head and go generalization. It's actually more serious than that. So harmonic map heat flow. Uh, if you go and you are doing geometric analysis, or anyone who has been to talks in geometric analysis or follow what's happening, people talk half of the talks about all sorts of flows. This is one of the most classical for the heat flow or harmonic maps. A lot of um, famous uh, geometers work on this, like Oklenbeck, Struberg, and so on. Uh, there were various reasons to do that, but one of them, for instance, was to try to identify the topological degree of a map U from R to S2 or PSU between many points of trying to understand uh, a smooth way to, to, to talk about topological degree of messy maps. Wave maps, this is known as the O3 model. It's one of the simplest systems admitting topological soliton. It's also relevant in general relativity. And the Schrodinger maps is a Heisenberg model in ferromagnetism. Thinking on your observation in ferromagnetism, what your models are magnets. What you will chase are the direction of the of the pole. That's why they're unit one normalized. Because that's you, you just want to see it like imagine a you know, magnet and then they, they start interacting with each other. Okay, you see the model. Or it is a particular case of the Landau Lifshitz Gilbert equation, which is Sorry, for going back, this is the full model that combines the heat flow and the Schrodinger flow. Um, and they all share the same family of topological solitons. I should say a word about topological solitons, and these are explicit objects, the harmonic maps. So I'm, I'm having a sentence here saying a lot of things. What are the steady states for all these PDs? If you feed any of these PDs with a harmonic map as an initial data, it stays constant in time, it doesn't. Just think, you have the heat flow, you feed it with the harmonic maps, that means that the, no, the, the elliptic equation gives you zero, that means it is zero, it doesn't evolve. These are solid, they just stay put. Now, topological solitons, there's a whole book on topological solitons. Uh, physicists have been very interested in these models. So, uh, so physically, topological sol solitons are, are supposed to be smooth, coherent structure that are meant to model actual particles in various models, like Young, Mills, Ginsburg, Landau, or the model that I talked to, Landau, Lichis, Gilbert. So they are meant, they come from physical considerations, but also, if you, if you care about the flows, what flows are you know, important in geometry, they carry topological information intact and encode the actual topological information of general maps. Because when, when I said that in geometry, they, they, the, this was helpful in, in, in trying to understand the topological degree of a map, the whole point is that you start with a messy map and you kind of try to make sense of the topological degree and, and the heat flow, what everyone would do. Some some PD course in, in, in parabolic PD, you know, it starts smoothing out, it starts making things very nice. So that's why people like these things. And somehow, and you can see as, as, as I go through these slides, that they somehow start unveiling the, the, the topology of the uh, of the actual map. Solitons. So solitons, as I said, in these particular problems are smooth, finite energy harmonic maps. R2 to S2, and you've seen the equation before. Their structure is well known. The geometers worked a lot, they're very interesting. So they characterize fact one, a couple of facts about these solid ones. After a stereographic projection, uh, that uh, 
let me maybe before you anyone knows what would be the simplest solid orb or anyone let me put I'm trying to this, this is something important but this comes at the bottom if you think of harmonic maps from from um R2 to S2 I'm trying to, to, to make this more sensible rather than going through, through, through the side. Anyone knows an example of a harmonic map? So the simplest. I mean, cost. You, ah, thank you. Yeah, obviously, that, that is the simplest one. So if you go from here to here, yeah, if you take the whole plane to a single point, obviously, you're going to be harmonic map, guaranteed. But this is trivial topology, right? Something more complex. And there's something more complex, just to give a hint, just try to wrap the plane around the sphere. The complex analysis, you probably do the other way around. You unravel the sphere to the field. That's a stereographic projection. So if you put that in good coordinates, essentially you get your first harmonic map. And this creates kind of a, of a recipe to, to, to create more and more harmonic mass. But the idea is that after a stereographic projection in which you identify the target with R2, spherical, each soliton is Q is in a correspondence with a rational function or its conjugate between Riemann spheres. So imagine that you have maps from C to C and you've got your polynomials and fractions. They are harmonic maps, and any harmonic map falls into this category. Now, this is a very important fact, and one should not go next without saying what, what's fantastic about this. In a lot of the PDEs, where you have or you expect to have solitons, one of the key questions is what are the solitons of this project? This problem. Try to identify. The soliton can be something like in this case, steady, meaning if you feed the data with the, 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 the program with an initial data, then it just takes put, or you can have traveling solitons or various models. But what's important is that whenever you plug the soliton into the equation, you end up with an elliptic, nonlinear elliptic PD. And there is a question of can you characterize, can you put down, write down all the solitons? That's a very difficult problem. For many systems, you cannot do that. This is one of the few examples where everything is explicit. So the fact that you do understand all these objects is very important. Now, each soliton is characterized by a topological degree. There is a formula, but again, the way you should think is that you have a map from here to here, and the topological degree does nothing else but count how many times you wrap the plane around the sphere. There is also the energy of a soliton, which is basically the gradient of the map in measured in the two. And, and the energy is actually closely related to the topological. And I already went through this example. The simplest, the simplest uh, way to, the simplest soliton one can think is it's simply to the stereographic projection, right? Project plane and run between these two with various maps. Simplest one would be Z, simplest would be just identity here, and then you wrap it. But no one stops to consider it's a square. Ooh, actually, fractions are also it's good. Or one over Z would be essentially just sweeping the north. And south poles. There are various model stuff that tell you how to create uh, these, uh, these uh, harmonic maps. So two things that I think are important here is the family is explicit. We know all the solitons and the topological degree. So let's get back to our uh, Lambda Lifshitz Gilbert question, because this is 
mostly what I'm going to talk about. I I may say in passing one or two few words about the, the wave maps, but but we don't have enough time, so I'll just focus on 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 these two flows and actually more or less separately. Again, if you take a equals zero, you end up with a heat flow. If you take b equals zero, you end up with a Schrodinger flow. Like I said, this is the landard dishes gilbert equation. Uh, and it models dynamics in isotropic ferromag ferromagnets. Uh, I discussed the two uh, extreme cases and uh, people studied the two of them together. Something to keep in mind is that if B is positive, then, then you know you are a parabolic B, you should look just one time direction. Uh, but if you take B equal to zero, so you are left with a Schrodinger uh, equation, then, then it just makes sense to look in more time directions. Now, uh, these equations are different in nature. The heat flow is dissipative, the Schrodinger map and the wave map are dispersive. And one of the, 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 the major problems is global robustness of solutions. Now, just a prediction. Which of these PDs do you think is best understood? I don't know. Schrodinger, wave, or heat? Heat. And the reason? Smoothing. Smoothing. And the geometers are interested about it. So there are <laughs> two communities working, you know, at the same time on it. But but smoothing, it's uh, the dissipation is a much stronger effect than, than dispersive. So before before I uh, go into into saying that uh, so, so the heat flow is by far understood, actually Struve has established some sort of solid or resolution conjecture. Uh, and I'll put that on, uh, on, on the slide, but before I, I uh, we need that slide, maybe just two quick things uh, about these uh, PDEs. Uh, the, the heat flow for harmonic maps and Schrodinger maps, they obey the same scaling, the parabolic scaling. So if you have a solution to the map and you do the parabolic scaling, you get the new solution. Uh, the Schrodinger maps conserve energy while what you expect for the, for the heat flow, the energy is released. So, solid or resolution for heat flow for harmonic maps. This is due to Struve. So, what does Struve say? And this is a loose statement. I, I, I don't want to uh, write everything very, very much, much detail. But what he says is the following You start with heat flow, you fill it up with the data. It's nice, or yeah, just you'll get regularized on it. But it's happy to general, general data. And the solution is classic, just as you expect from a nonlinear, from, from a parabolic equation, smooth, strong solution, except maybe at a finite number of points in space time. So you flow, 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 but you may encounter some singularities along. What happens at a singularity? At a singularity, there is a smooth, finite energy harmonic map that separates or bubbles off the various words that people use. But essentially, you separate the harmonic map. And the separation process is as follows. Near the singular time, you pretty much concentrate a full harmonic map, one of these very smooth objects that then kind of bubbles off from the picture and it walks away with topological degree and energy. So the system classical solutions just lose that bubble off. You decrease in energy by whole quanta of how much that bubble is. And also you count topological degrees somehow. You lose, you, you can say, oh, so I have a degree here. And in a way, uh, uh, because that picture again is zoomed in, it's a, it's a micro scale, it's a, it's a bubble phenomenon. Essentially, if you rescale the map, you have these, these parameters. If you rescale, you see the clean bubble, but it's a rescale function. And there, there is a rigorous way on how to continue solutions past singularity in the class of energy decreasing solutions. So you don't look at, uh, how to say, bizarre things, because there are bizarre things, stopping, constructing things that actually increase their energy. But those are non physical. So this is a very clean very clean 
picture of the flow and I'm, I'm, I'm hiding something here. I'm talking about the, the, the singularity formation in finite time. There is also, you can obtain this bubble at infinity, at time t equal infinity. But essentially, all I'm trying to say is that you start with the messy functions where you can treat anything and it starts evolving, it separates this bubble, it may create them at infinity and everything else dissipates. These bubbles are separated, there is no energy in between them. Geometry say there is no energy in the neck of these bubbles. So it's kind of a dream picture of how you would like to characterize a nonlinear PD. Like if you can get such a thing, it would be fantastic. Now, the expectation is that something similar happens for wave maps and Schrodinger maps. And what I'm going to tell you next is how far we are from getting anywhere close to it. So what is the trivial solid that you pointed out? It's a point, right? Uh, these are constant maps. There is no bubble. There is nothing there because if you rescale them, you get the same point. So there is nothing interesting. Now, going up in energy, the next non-trivial soliton is exactly the stereographic projection that I was telling you. That has energy. It's a solid object. You have to wrap energy around the scale. And the first thing that you notice is, OK, because to see something non-trivial energy, but most important topologically, you have to have at least four pi energy, you come up with what's called a threshold conjecture. If you do not have that much energy, if you are below that energy, there is nowhere to bubble. You should start with the data and just be a smooth solution. Well, Strube's result tells you that. Because it tells you that if you are not smooth, you should bubble a full quanta. You should bubble at least four pi energy. But you don't have that energy, so you're going to be globally smooth. Uh, we don't know how to solve this problem for Schrodinger maps. We did it for the equivariant setup, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about equivariance. Uh, but we don't know how to do it in general case. For wave maps, it's been settled in, in some very laborious works by, by uh, the Taro Stervens, by uh, Bigger Schlag, and Tao has probably five papers totaling like six, 700 pages. Basically, they were all trying to settle this down for wave maps. So if we can't even if we can't even deal with radiation or you know it's so difficult uh, getting to what Struve did, it's we are far away, like solid of type which you kind of say, well, I'm always gonna be having a nice flow except at these particular points that I see a singularity. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't do math. You know, you're hopeful. PhD students, you can keep going. So um, let's talk a little bit about blow up, bubbling of separation of harmonic maps. You see, Struve's theory highlights that blow up may occur. It tells you that if it occurs, it has that nice harmonic map bubbling of, but it doesn't actually tell you that it happens, or it didn't tell. 50 years ago. So for a while, there was this thing, OK, do you actually have bubbling? Now, there is a theoretical reason, which I found it in the paper of Topping, that you should have singularity. Because otherwise, the heat flow would provide a deformationary tract of all the, of the space of rational maps, let's say, of a particular topological degree, to the polynomials. And topologists will tell you those are separate spaces. It cannot be the case. But that's just telling you something. It's an obstructive argument. Can you actually prove? Can you construct things? So you want to know, can they separate? And how exactly? So the first example was not constructive, was still obstruction type, was, was due to Chang Ding here. And then Raphael and Schwer constructed solution with what people doing numerics around this problem predicted. They predicted this rate of blow up and they got their hands on it. And more recent work by Davila, Del Pino, and Wei uh, 
give combinations uh, when going to general, general, uh, not, not, not necessarily in the case of symmetries. So they, what these people are doing are saying, we can construct solutions and we can describe low operates. Now something, another important thing that maybe escaped your attention, if you, or if you didn't know and I didn't point, there exist sequences on which you have these bounds. I'm not saying that for any sequence, it's not a continuous sequence. All I'm saying is that you have these bad times and on some particular sequences as you go towards the singularity time, if you zoom correctly, you are gonna see a bubble. But nothing precludes a couple of scenarios that on a different sequence, you can see another bubble. And that's quite problematic because it creates a certain uncertainty in, into what you bubble off there. And, uh, or, or simply that you can bubble off or prepare to bubble off and then move away from being like a soliton and come back and, and do strange things. Is, is, is this clear? What, because it's, it's a subtle thing the, the whole thing is that this is a is a soft argument to extract this. It's, it's not again. It's it's not a continuous type argument. So the bottom line is again on a particular TM you see a precise Q, but nobody tells you that on this you see like another Q tilde. So you bubble something else off on a different subsequence time. So. In these cases, the, the, in these constructions, uh, people explicitly model a particular solid, but these are constructive examples. They don't answer the question on whether you can do strange things in between. And this, it's still, as of now, a major open question in, 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 in the field. So recent results of Jacques Gayek Laurie and Schlag proved some weaker version uh, of, of this, essentially just saying that you are not gonna go away, go away from the full family of solitons, but you can still jump. They don't know. This is an open question if you can jump between various solitons. Uh, and in the case of, in the corotational case, which is, which is the case with symmetries, uh, they were able to prove the, 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 the uniqueness of the limit. There is just one on a continuous sequence of time, but there is more rigidity in this problem. So this pretty much is the state of the art for the heat flow. There is a solid on resolution conjecture and constructions are done and open question uniqueness of this particular state in the limit. Uh, like I said, for the other flows, we are not yet there. So let's talk a little bit about dynamic of solutions near solitons. So it's a, it's a more modest, it is a more modest task, but it's important in trying to do the, 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 send the full picture. And something to keep in mind is that this is a large data problem in, in, in the sense that it's a large data, but it, it's near data problem. And, and just, I should say, for all nonlinear PDs, large data problems are a headache, particularly for dispersing ones. It's, we, we are pretty good at doing small data, but large data is pretty difficult. However, in this case, when you do a perturbation of an explicit object, you can almost think that that perturbation is small. So in a way, it's you are still kind of a small data problem. So that's why we, we, we try to understand these days, these type of problems, but it's also a crucial piece in the theory because it tells you at least what happens near, near solid on. Uh, these are again, difficult questions to, to address and a good place to start the investigation is in the context of, of uh, solutions with symmetries. 
And you know, the first symmetry that comes to everyone's mind is it's, it's a, a radial. Now, radial doesn't really go hand in hand with this with these, uh, type of maps, but there is a substitute, which is, which is the equivariance. And I'm going to uh, cover that. For instance, the solitons are, are equivariant and not radial functions. Uh, and now, what are equivariant functions? Uh, again, maybe a picture would be more helpful than, than these formulas. Equivariant uh, function. So imagine you decide that zero goes to South Pole, right? And then from South, you go on the positive axis infinity, and then you wrap this around going all the way to north. So infinity goes to north on a great circle, right? So then what you do, you start moving in the angular direction, and you replicate what you, this, this, this picture moving around the equator. This is an equivalent map. The only rule is, well, you start from here to here and make sure you complete the circle when you come back. But there are a couple of speeds. You can do rotate once in the basis and once around the equator. That is one equivariance. And minus one if you do it the other way around. But you can go once around here and twice around here. This is, by the way, with a stereographic projection, would be the z square map that creates exactly this effect. So this is what you should take away from this. This is the more natural symmetry of, of associated to this, uh, to this map. This is an equivalent map. So maps that, oh, okay, this is the formulation. So the harmonic maps, like, you know, for the first time I'm writing you explicit uh, formulas for the harmonic maps in these in this, in this coordinates. Uh, all the harmonic maps, uh, pretty much that, that the k equivariant ones, they start from the from a very basic the model, the z to the m model, and then you can you can rescale it and then rotate it a little bit. Uh, yes. Are there not equivariant harmonic maps and vice versa? Um, yes, yes. Uh, the cheapest way to think about I made a very, very uh, a specific choice. I said zero to the South Pole. I can use a translation there. And I break this nice picture. And uh, the, the equivalent harmonic maps are forced to be essentially CDM in the stereographic projection model. Or, or if you fl flip the picture is one of us here. On the other hand, the full class, like I said earlier, are all the rational functions. So it's a it's a subclass of the class that, that has symmetry. Okay. So the flows discussed above, all of them, the, the heat flow, Schrodinger wave maps, they all preserve equivalence. Now there is one advantage. The heat flow for harmonic maps and the wave maps, they actually have an additional degree reduction in that, remember when I said that they have to, they, they, they can obey this, uh, you take this graph, create something here and then you rotate. In Schrodinger maps, you have, in, oh, sorry, in heat flows, you can pretty much nullify alpha. So you can have dynamics that more or less focuses completely just on these circles and it's more or less stays constant in this direction. In the, angular coordinate, uh, and this is not something that happens for Schrodinger maps. And there is a simple, simple reason for that. 
heat flow is a gradient type flow. If you prepare your data such that the gradient is really just in this direction, going south to north on a great circle, the evolution is going to go in that direction and it's going to stay the same, it will be invariant to alpha. What does the Schrodinger flow do? It looks at the gradient, but then it does what? It applies a rotation, I. The I is a pi over two rotation in the bundle. So all of a sudden it shifts everything in the meridian parallel to the equator. So this is, this is a, a cheap explanation of why for heat flows being like a gradient flow, you, you, you can keep the dynamics trivialized in that direction, but, but no, you cannot do it for Schrodinger map. So more or less you add a degree of, of uh, complexity to the problem. But the bottom line is, let's get back. In the equivariant uh, setup, the heat, uh, the, the harmonic maps are asymptotically stable. What does that mean? That if I start the heat flow for harmonic, I perturb a harmonic map. I take a, a clean one of those Z to the M models and I do a little perturbation in the equivariance class and I let it go, I'm not going to blow up. If there is a lot of charge, M greater or equal than three. Which by the way, if you remember, there was that question on what can you bubble off? Shrube told you, you are probably going to bubble off, but what can you? So there was a question, how do you bubble? How do you blow up? And, but there is also the question, can you blow up any harmonic map? And this result of Gustafsson, Nakanishi Tsai, and Gustafsson, Kang Tsai, they essentially tell you, you don't bubble off any harmonic map. So you cannot see bubbles of any, any type you want. For instance, uh, so if M is greater or equal than three, and I should put absolute value here, if M is two, uh, there is no finite time blow up, but there is infinite time solutions that actually can do very strange things. They can have eternal oscillations, which is not exactly this, but it's almost like this. They can go to a soliton, move far away in dynamics or, or between rescaling of the solitons. They can do very strange times. They, they can relax, contract, relax, contract. So they can have very, very unexpected somehow behavior in this picture. Uh, but again, this is in infinite time. And it also answered this question on it, of, of the fact that you cannot bubble every single uh, uh, solitary. But this reading a harmonic map, the general case is still open on what exactly can you bubble because this is a in the case with symmetry, it's not clear that outside the symmetry class, this is actually stable. Uh, the Schrodinger map problem, as I said, is more difficult since the corrotational setup is not an option. The problem basically inherits this additional degree of uh, complexity. So what is the state of the art for these perturbations? Uh, again, Gustafsson, Kang, Tsai, Nakanishi Tsai. So these are the teams that did the work for, I, I mentioned them for the heat flow, but originally they started with Schrodinger maps. And then they realized that that techniques can cover the, cover the heat flow. They proved that small perturbations are stable. So you don't see a blow up. On the other hand, if you go to one equivariant, so these are perturbation of the stereographic projection, then you can have blow up. We, with Tatar, we established stability regimes. So if you do classical perturbations, compact support, for instance, uh, you are stable. But what, what was left open is somehow the very borderline case. So high charge, don't blow up. One charge, blow up. And these are all the counter examples, all the, all the blow up examples that I mentioned for heat flow were exactly in this class. Uh, what's happening for n equal to? So not only that we uh, open this, but we, we address this, but actually we, we, we bring quite a bit of clarity of the overall dynamics maps near this Q2. And I would say that the 
last slide, so I guess I should kind of wrap it up. So let's just clarify what is the, the, the picture here. Maybe again, draw a picture. I have the Q2 manifold, which is the Z squared stereographic projection. So this is the basic harmonic map. But then I have rescalings. What I mean by that, there is the lambda parameter, and also there is the rotation. Because these maps, they can move their scale, but they can also rotate. So I can, I have kind of an infinite cylinder. If you, if you want to think so, let's some of you here. You can think of this way. And I start with maps that are very close to this manifold of this scale. So the energy conservation, that is energy conservation, tells me that if I start near this manifold, right? I'm not gonna move away, I'm gonna stay near it. The, sorry, it's two consideration, topological degree and energy, because you can create strange things where you are topologically trivial, but you have energy above four pi, but, but then that should dissipate. That should, sorry, disperse, that, that should not see anything like this. But you are gonna stay nearby. For high charge, stability means you are in a more small neighborhood of boring stuff, you don't move much. Blow up means you move all the way to infinity. That means if you if you think you concentrate this whole map on a very small scale, right? All its energy, all its mass is concentrated on a scale, and you see a harmonic map. For n equal to, we are trying to understand fully this problem. That that is, we are trying to understand how complex can the dynamics of these two parameters can be. And what does the map do? So let me go over the main result. The first one is we prove strong dispersive estimates. Just, just think this would be the counterpart of whatever you like, dissipative estimates, whatever estimates you need to close nonlinear problems. We prove that they hold true for uh, there are two components here, maybe I should say. You have the map U, and then you have the closest solid on Q, and then you have this kind of small deviation. And what you need to understand is what are the scales of this solid on? What is the scale? How is this moving? And what is this tiny difference doing? So we prove dispersive estimates for this, that this is kind of type of radiation type. Uh, and this is an important question in many blow up problems. Because in many of these blow up problems, there is this question on okay, do I still see the linear character of the problem, or is my nonlinearity fighting and destroying, let's say, a dissipative effect? What we are saying here is that in this picture, you do not destroy these aspects. The blow up is simply a scale change. The fact that you, you concentrate your scale because of this rescaling argument. But other than that, the rest is still radiation type. So this is a very nice clarifying aspect and it, it wasn't known before we did this work. We proved that there is no blow up in finite time and some control but we construct solutions, explicit solutions, which blow up in infinite time. And uh, just like, what is the grand conclusion? The dynamics of the map is one of these Q2, which again, think of it, Z square stereographic, rescaled, so it changes scale and it rotates, plus a more small dispersive type. It's global in time, with the parameter lambda continuous. Lambda is the important thing because that tells you how the, 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 the scale changes. So when I say blow up, let, let me clarify something. When, when you have Q of lambda times R, this is the scale. What's happening if lambda goes to infinity? The energy is the same, but take the second derivative. 
lambda blows up, comes up, right? So higher norms blow up. That's, that's why we call them blow up. So they keep their energies, but their regularity starts to suffer simply because you concentrate everything on a very small scale. So this is, this is the picture. And then the behavior of this parameter can belong to many scenarios, bounded globally, blow up or oscillatory. Like we can do all sorts of stuff. And in fact, we can construct dynamics following pretty much any nice curve on this manifold. Like if you if you tell me a, a certain curve, maybe coming back or going to infinity at a certain distance rate, I can I can kind of follow it. So it's a, it's a very complex uh, description of of the uh, analysis. How many minutes do I have? Five minutes. Okay, thank you. Uh, so. The basic approach is more or less, just a few words, is, is this idea of, again, maybe should to unravel. This is the manifold of solitons. You take a map, you try to identify the closest soliton, right? And then you need to understand the difference between the, the difference between you and the closest soliton. This is if you had worked in this type of problems, this is called modulation analysis, classically, except that pretty much everything that usually it's textbook fails in this case. So there are, there are many things that need to be augmented. And maybe I should just say, I, I didn't, I had no intention to do proofs, but what is novel or challenging versus what has been done before? And I'm just gonna put two slides. I'm going to ignore two in a minute. So the dynamics of the modulation parameters, how the closest soliton moves around this map. Well, in all prior works, things, or most of the prior works were done in the correlational setup where you could ignore the alpha variable. So in that case, pretty much, you had just a lambda parameter well, we have to chase two parameters. And naively would say, what's the big deal? Well, there is a big deal. The problem is that you're going to write ODEs for these two parameters. And there is a huge difference between an ODE that is scalar, a linear ODE with variable coefficients that is scalar, and a system, a two by two system. This, you integrate it explicitly, teach our students. This, you take A with constant coefficients. You never do A of T. And there are bizarre things that happen here. So this precludes actually us from, from fully, fully, completely understanding every single aspect of this problem. So just jumping from a dynamical system in one dimension in two dimension increases the difficulty of the problem by a lot. And we still not know if we do everything as efficient as we can. So that's one of the novel things. Let me let me jump over these two aspects and just conclude with the last slide. Identify the subtle mechanism responsible for, for decay. In most works around the issue of stability of a soliton or blow up of small perturbations of a soliton, there is a wide theoretical gap in the theory. What do I mean by that? When, when you have stability for any perturbation, things are clear because you start near a soliton and your dynamics is going to stay there, right? The problem is that if you encounter blow up, what people do is that they prepare the perturbation in a very specific way to create the blow up. But then nobody tells you what happens with many other data because it's a very difficult problem. So in a way, you don't know if that blow up, for instance, is generic, if any reasonable perturbation would blow up or every reasonable perturbation is stable. And it's, these are very difficult things. 
And in our case, what we are able to do is, is something very neat. Remember that the map is at the energy level. We work with coordinates. This is a classical geometrical trick. You don't work with the map because you want to work in the tangent bundle. That means take the derivative of your functions in an appropriate coordinate change. Derivative, that means you are at the level of L2. So generically, the field that you are to purchase is at the level of L2. In L2, you have little tally. Is a sum or k, p, k, c, square in L2. So this has a spectral projection. We do something very benign. We say, look, this is the generic space for my data. So let's say for, for initial data for this problem. If I improve the structure to just control, not the little L2, but the little L1, traces of pass of two, two. I do just pass of two, one. I do not have blow up. So there is very little room, very little room for blow up. It's only like logarithmic room. So what I'm telling you here is that for most of the solutions, most of the two you are going to mistake. You need to prepare your data very carefully to escape and blow up if you need it. And uh, also, Questions or comments? The local solutions is there also the kind of structure like for heat flows. If you don't take Cauchy problem, but just a local solution, the extrude result for law is such thing as extrude result for local solutions. Local solutions. So locally, like uh, satisfies things locally, not not like a Cauchy problem. I wouldn't. I, I wouldn't be the expert in that in that area. Uh, what's the dependence of this, the dynamics on the on the manifold? This the the output manifold because here you're restricted to the case of S two. But then I was wondering whether if the manifold is unbounded, well, what if it's two D? What the metric of the is there like? What's the, what, uh, is it stable? All these results are they stable in the change things? So uh, I'm, I'm cheating here big time because I use the fact that S2 has a rich group of symmetries. So everything that I'm doing here could not survive if I, if I cannot replicate these symmetries. And if you ask me, can I do something like this outside the class of symmetries? But yet, simply again, the threshold conjecture we says that you don't have in, enough energy so that you get at least the, the smallest material so we don't have uh, you should just the radiation should I don't get we, we, we don't know how to do that. So that tells you that the, the problem the problem for the problem without synthesis is, in, is incredibly difficult. So really, we, I'm not even sure if the next generation of PhD students will have the tools to do these very general things. Now, there is some work, but not in this direction. There is some work for, for, for trying to prove, trying to establish global world postness or local world postness for Schrodinger maps. Uh, Which equation did you ask me for? The, the, the oh, okay. Okay. I was just like, it's, it's a very it's easy yeah, one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. There is rich literature. Okay. I take that back. No, that was for Schrodinger maps. For heat flows, people look at maps between 90 volts, 90 volts, and, and, and a lot. But still, the questions that I, 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 I said that they are open. Such as this, this uniqueness of a profile in the blow up. If you cannot do them R2 to S2, 
then no hope for doing their return. That's that's a major open problem. So they will be open. But other than that, for for the more generic, uh, so the, the 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 parabolic world is way ahead of what we can do in the dispersive world. In the situation that you were describing there, you said that basically you've got stability in the sense that you don't have uh, the solitons. Mm -hmm. um, you, you have to take something very, very special in order to get. So does that have any implication for the physics behind it, the ferromagnetism? Um, you know, are you highly likely to be stable? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. That you are highly likely to be. The thing is... Sense. Every, every time I, I'm trying to understand what is generic or what is the definition of a generic statement. You know, mm -hmm. People say in soliton resolution conjecture that, you know, you start from a generic data and you're going to see this soliton somehow doing something. Mm -hmm. and, and if you try to chase what, what, what do you mean by the generic, generic data? I think you think is probably the one who kind of deals with yeah, some I think sort of. They're very different. I think, for example, I know there are results that. Uh, for certain equation, if you have a certain set of data, then like, let's say with, with probability one, you're having some good things, but the set of, you know, good data, the set of data that have good things is also, um, you know, what is called a meager set, yeah. but it's probability one. So it's hard to tell what this means by generic. <laughs> yeah, that's... Uh... Yes. Uh, <clears throat> is the... Jumps or drops or the topological degree of the map imply law or so because I remember you said at the blow up um you see change in the top topological degree, right? Yeah. Um is it possible to go backwards? Like assuming that at certain time, say it changes logically. And you try to be going back in time in a good flow. I don't know if this is where shooting it. Oh, but we are so far from understanding the phenomenology you talk about. Oh, okay. Yeah. Because in go in the heat flow, it's it's you'd have to have quite a lot of prior knowledge of what you bubble up, because otherwise you unless you take the bubble and you put it in your pocket, you don't know where you you what you had you you had before. But by the way, by the way. The dream in and one of the dreams in in, in this PDB is, is in the dispersive series, it's how to continue the solution past the singular time. People in the parabolic world know how to do it in the class of you know reasonable solutions. Now, you have to decrease energy, then they know how to smoothly go past the singularity. We don't know how to do that in heat flow or Schrodinger. That's another dream to, to say you blow up and now take some sort of a weak, weak type solutions that's that's strong immediately before and after and, and try to in a natural way continue these solutions past to make a meaningful sense. What would be a physical continuation? We don't know how to do that. That's a dream. And so that's what I'm saying. We are here we are kind of scratching the surface. We are really trying to get get something going, but we are very far from what you know, what people would like to see as a complete picture of this estimate. You are right that in the Schrodinger maps, if I were to be able, I should I should come both ways, right? But to even know what you bubble of, one of the, this is why I don't know if I made enough, I stressed enough this picture that Struve tells you on this sequence of time, you are going to bubble off the harmonic one, one, right? What if you bubble off a different one or a different, you start having an uncertain what, what exactly had happened at that point. And, and you know, this, this can propagate in a theory. So that's, that's. Is that statement about the bubble, is it like some kind of compactness? Compactness, it's yes. Just, it's yes. just compactness. It's just compactness. I see. That's why it's a soft argument. If you have your arbitrary curve I described here, then it's not, probably it's not that possible to extend it beyond the, beyond the time. Yeah. 
Oh, but that, that's infinite. Sorry, that's, that's infinite. infinite. I, I don't but know. But is it possible to have such things for the finite time? <laughs> that's the big question. <laughs> that's the big question. Because, and actually, it's, it's, it's more complex than that. Yeah, the energy and topological constraints tell me I'm close to Q. To a single Q, it's a rigid problem in some sense. Over there, the problem is if you swap the Qs. So, in some sense, to think that. The space of rational function is humongous. It's, it's huge. Or let's say, even if you take the ones with this particular topological degree, the equivariant is like a kind of a curve in that. And I'm lucky because the equivariance tells me this is stable. But I don't know what's going to happen outside. Because I it's these are dealing with, with non non it's, 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 it's tricky. So I'm not not going in that direction. Seems to be an awful lot that is un. Yeah, yeah. People just at this moment, I think the the field is just trying to produce all sorts of scenarios, mm -hmm. rule out other scenarios, and uh, you know get as far as one can do. Very interesting. So. Any other questions or comments? Then that's it. Thank you, and again. We're done. In fact, there was even a little. Um, oh, someone kicked off saying 10 minutes of a